I'm Courtney Smith. And I'm Elise Sharp. And we are two Shakespeare nerds who decided to make a podcast about our love for Shakespeare. In this podcast, we will tackle as many dimensions to Shakespeare's plays as we can by looking at the text, examining the historical context in which it was written, and how the text is viewed through modern lenses of feminism, racism, classism, colonialism, nationalism, ableism, all of the isms. We will discuss how his plays shaped both the past and present, and, as actors, how his plays can be responsibly performed today, all while trying our best to approach his works without giving in to bardolatry. So, Shakespeare anyone? Hi listeners, it's Courtney here. If you are listening to this episode after 2023, you might be wondering, who is this Corey Lee Smith host? When we started this podcast, I went by that stage name, Corey. I've chosen to leave my stage name, and, as you know, I now go by Courtney. But before you enjoy past Elise and past Courtney's episodes in our back catalog, I wanted to clarify the name switch. Now that I've set that straight, I invite you to sit back, relax, and enjoy the episode. Hello, listeners. This is Courtney. Elise and I are so thrilled to continue bringing episodes of Shakespeare Anyone to listeners like you for free. We do this out of our love for Shakespeare, theater making, scholarship, and decentering dead white men. We put a lot of hard work into research, recording, editing, and generally producing a podcast. With that said, I'm here to remind you all that we have a Patreon page if you want to support our current work and our future goals that we believe Patreon will help us achieve. We've created a variety of support levels and continue to create exclusive bonus content for our patrons on a monthly basis. Our bonus content so far includes Shakespeare Stuff We Loved This Month posts, where we share the Shakespeare-related products we are obsessing over. Not only that, but we already launched bonus episodes. One is an extension on our conversation with Dr. Simone Chess about John Lilly's Galatea and Early Modern Trans Studies. And the second is a conversation with special guest Stephanie from Protest Too Much Podcast, in which we review Joel Cohen's Macbeth starring Denzel Washington and Francis McDormand. Elise and I also discuss Shakespeare-adjacent content, like movies, TV shows, books, to name a few, and share those conversations exclusively to Patreon. These are incredible conversations you can unlock as a patron. We also have plans for additional bonus episodes, including more special guests, more film reviews, and even an Ask Us Anything. Distinguished patrons even receive exclusive voting power and snail mail. If you would like to join us and support the production of this podcast, or just check out the Shakespeare-themed names we've given the support levels, head to patreon.com slash shakespeareanyone. The link will also be in our episode descriptions. And if you like what you hear, Elise and I would greatly appreciate it if you could rate, review, and follow us on Apple Podcast and Spotify. Your review might even make it on an episode. When you're done, be sure to follow us on Instagram and Twitter, and then tell a friend. Word of mouth is our best form of advertisement. Thank you for listening and all of the support you give us and the podcast. Now, on to the episode. Welcome to another Shakespeare Anyone mini-episode. In these mini-episodes, we'll be exploring topics that are related to Shakespeare but aren't necessarily connected to whatever play we've been discussing. And they're mini because, well, they're shorter than our other episodes. They're like quartos if the regular episodes are folio editions. In today's episode, we'll be talking about food and cooking in early modern England and Shakespeare's plays. According to John Tufts, actor, cook, and author of Fat Rascals, Dining at Shakespeare's Table, quote, Shakespeare talks a lot about food. He talks about food people eat. He talks about how people look like food. He insults people with food. He names characters after food. He bakes his characters into food, unquote. And Tufts is not wrong. From Twelfth Night, Act 1, Scene 3, Sir Andrew Aguecheek, quote, 
I am a great eater of beef, and I believe that does harm to my wit, unquote. Essentially, Sir Andrew is comically saying that beef has contributed to his stupidity. From Macbeth, Act 2, Scene 3, The Porter, quote, Drink, sir, is a great provoker of three things, nose painting, sleep, and urine. Lechery, sir, it provokes and unprovokes. It provokes the desire, but takes away the performance, unquote. The porter is listing all of the consequences of drinking, typically while quite drunk. From As You Like It, Act 3, Scene 2, Touchstone, quote, Truly, thou art damned like an ill-roasted egg, all on one side, unquote. Oof, what an insult. Now, if Shakespeare is obsessed with food, it only makes sense that food was vital for people from his time. In the early modern period, health and food were inextricably linked. As we discussed in our Four Humors mini-episode, diet was an important component of health. The 12th or 13th century lifestyle and diet book, the Regimen Sanitatis Salernitatum had been translated into almost every European language and saw nearly 40 editions by 1501. In 1528, King's printer and bookbinder for Henry VIII, Thomas Bertolet, published Thomas Painel's English translation of The Regimen. And so food was a tool for balancing out your body's humors, which means that the food an early modern English person ate was chosen in order to balance out their body. Again, listen to our Four Humors episode if you have not yet. For example, if your body runs cold, you want to eat spicier food. If you served duck, which doctors said was cold, adding pepper, which was hot, would provide the spice your body required to balance out your cold humor. And you do the reverse if your body runs hot. And if you're wondering what Shakespeare would have eaten for breakfast... According to Tudor and 17th century experience owner and founder Bridget Webster, breakfast was not a meal eaten during the medieval times by most people. It was specifically children, old people, sick people, and pregnant women who were entitled to this meal. However, working people, travelers, and the rich classes took up an early morning meal by the Elizabethan era. What did these people eat? Bread. The wealthy ate a bread called manchette, Working people ate a bread called cheat. Shakespeare likely ate the latter. Fun fact, it wasn't until Dutch workers immigrated to England in the late 16th century that the English spread butter on their bread. Previously, they used lard. And if you were wealthy, you might have added rosemary or sage to the butter for taste or medicinal purposes in order to eat and live healthily. The biggest meal of the day for an Elizabethan was dinner which was eaten midday or between 11 o'clock and noon. The dinner hour was strict, and it was unusual for a dinner to be served later than noon. We know this because salty guests have written about how unusual it was for their host to wish to eat dinner at a later time, like 1 o'clock. Their final meal, which we today think of as dinner, was called supper. In the early modern period, obviously before electricity, people had to prepare their meal before it got dark. Lighting your kitchen by candle was expensive. And the alternative, rush lights, made from animal fat, was not ideal for a kitchen environment due to the smell. If you watch a period drama set in the Tudor and early Stuart period, you will likely see the food of this time depicted as meat-centric. Lots of roasts and stews accompanied by crusty slices of bread, or King Henry VIII munching on a turkey leg. However, the cuisine in Shakespeare's time was much more diverse than that. First of all, the church's liturgical calendar dictated on which days meat could be eaten. Wednesdays and Fridays were meat-free, as well as the seasons of Advent and Lent. Those found to be eating or selling meat on these days would be heavily fined, so having separate menus for these days was essential. And in Shakespeare's time, people ate very spicy and intensely flavored food. Between the 13th and 17th centuries, there was an international European cuisine with imported ingredients from China, India, and the Spice Islands, a small group of islands in the northeast of Indonesia. So think cinnamon, nutmeg, and cardamom. And while myth claims that spices were used to hide the taste of spoiled meat, Wendy Wall, author of Recipes for Thought, Knowledge and Taste in the Early Modern English Kitchen, debunks that myth. 
spices were too expensive for that use and were instead used for their value. If an early moderner wanted to preserve meat, they could use salt, which was far less expensive. While medieval England had produced a useful range of culinary vegetables, new gardening technologies were brought over from Holland and Flanders by Catherine of Aragon and Catherine Parr. There was a growing demand for fresh vegetables, which led to the establishment of market gardens in England. In turn, this led to more varieties of fruits and vegetables becoming available for use in the early modern kitchen. According to Peter Breer's Cooking and Dining in Tudor and Early Stuart England, the following is a list of all vegetables, fruits, and herbs used in Robert May's 1660 book of recipes entitled Accomplished Cook. Vegetables. Artichokes, globe in Jerusalem, asparagus, beans, French and garden, beetroot, white cabbages, cauliflowers, carrots, chives, red colworts, cucumbers, white endive, gourds, cabbage lettuce, musk melons, champignon mushrooms, onions, parsnips, crucifix peas, pumpkins, sweet potatoes, skirrets, spinach, turnips, and watercress. Herbs. Alexander's, balm, bloodwort, borage, barnet, chamomile, chervelle, corn salad, wild garlic, marigold flowers, marjoram, mint, parsley, pennyroyal, purslane, rosemary, red sage, samphire, savory, scurvy grass, sorrel, succory, tansy, and thyme. Fruits. Apples apple codlings, pippins apples, apricots, barberries, cherries, damsons, gooseberries, grapes, lemons, medlars, melons, oranges, pears, plums, quinces, raspberries, strawberries, and wardens. The most important of these, according to Breers, were the recent additions of citrus fruits and potatoes to the English diet. Oranges and lemons went from being a rare delicacy to being imported in much larger quantities. They provided an alternative to vinegar in many recipes and could be combined with sugar for banquet sweetmeats. Their juices made excellent sauces for meats such as capon. Both the sweet potato and the Virginian potato, for those horticulturalists out there, that's Ipomea batatos and Solanum tuberosum, respectively, were grown in and imported into England during this time, though they remained comparatively rare throughout the period. And if you lived in London, you could get any and all of your food from a larger small market that would be open daily until dark, in a small brick-and-mortar food shop, or go to an Elizabethan cookery shop and buy what Bridget Webster calls an Elizabethan takeaway. That includes ready-made meats, pies, tarts, and soups. Unless they were chefs, Men didn't cook, so inns with restaurants were options for single or working men. Additionally, the shift from medieval feudal society saw changes in the running of noble households that affected the national diet. As the newly wealthy entrepreneurial class grew and acquired estates, they did not inherit the same responsibilities or establish relationships with those that lived on their property compared to the more established families. This new generation of estate owners did not need or want to provide employment to an extensive number of serving men, which were now seen as more of a drain on finances than a symbol and source of power and status. They favored a smaller number of staff and cut back on medieval hospitality traditions. Gentlemanly serving men who were loyal companions to their employers were gradually replaced by fewer low-status servants who provided only basic domestic services. This left a vacuum in the lesser noble and gentry houses, which still required someone to oversee the running of the household. The obvious replacement for these new estate owners was the unpaid labor of their wives. While royal and noble wives had previously been provided, and were in charge of running, entirely separate households, while the main household was left to the care of serving men who reported directly to their masters, noble women of early modern England saw their role expanding into domestic management of their husbands' estates. This shift was not without some misogynistic panic. Henry Percy, 9th Earl of Northumberland, protested that the kitchen, buttery, or pantry, quote, are not places proper for women, unquote, 
and that men should keep command over their servants in their own hands instead of handing it over to their wives. He was convinced that if a wife were given control over the household accounts, she would cut essentials in order to spend on her own vanities. However, these misogynistic views were anathema to the beliefs of many of the Earl's contemporaries. For example, in Thomas Fuller's 1642 book, The Holy State, the first chapter of the first volume is entitled The Good Wife and details the many benefits of wifely care. These noble women kept diaries that confirmed their expanding role and show that they not only instructed their servants in all household manners, they led them by example. According to Peter Breer's Cooking and Dining in Tudor and Early Stuart England, quote, around 1600, Lady Margaret Hoby recorded her days spent in supervising the sowing of wheat, measuring corn in the granary, catching trout or crayfish, gathering apples, pulling hemp, potting honey, preserving, and candle making. These and a whole series of other tasks were of paramount importance in this age of domestic self-sufficiency, unquote. And, despite the Earl of Northumberland's misgivings, many noble ladies were excellent practical cooks and more than capable of running a kitchen and a household. While the household cook would take care of everyday meals, the lady of the house would focus on specific, high-quality dishes for their own tables and banquets. They collected recipes and carefully transcribed them into manuscript recipe books. According to Peter Breers, quote, Some of these are of exceptional size and quality, far exceeding any of the man-authored printed recipe books of Elizabethan or Jacobean date, unquote. And their instructions, including, quote, how to determine the desirable qualities of most foodstuffs, show that they had a deep understanding of raw materials and knew how to obtain the best value for their money, unquote. Wendy Wall recounts that, as she was reading through approximately 150 recipe collections manuscripts, she had found that the authors did not segregate medical recipes from food recipes. For example, one early modern cookbook had an epilepsy recipe followed by a dessert. In addition, some meals might have benefits nutritionally and medicinally. According to Wall, one was a cough syrup said to help your lungs, but it could also be served at a very fancy dinner party for dessert. The recipe manuscripts are also a window into the women cooking in an early modern English kitchen. And some of these manuscript authors had a sense of humor. One manuscript contains marginalia that says, quote, How to make a right Presbyterian. You combine malice and pride and ambition, and you mix it up. Unquote. Other recipes included in these manuscripts were transcribed from printed cookery books. As publishers recognized wealthy women's growing interest in recipes and culinary information, they began to issue more titles to meet this growing new market. England had its most active cookery and recipe publication between 1550 and 1650. And the published cookbooks also tell us a lot about what was happening in the early modern English kitchen. First and foremost, these published books tell us who was cooking what and when. In addition, one of the recipe books, Delights for Ladies by Hugh Platt, had a poem in the preface that says the housewife is like the eternal artist or like a god who can take things out of nature and make them immortal in time. During this time, we also see new words entering the English language to describe the people who are now performing kitchen work. Woman cook first appeared in 1530, Kitchen Maid in 1550, Kitchen Wench in 1590, Scullion Wench in 1602, and Female Housekeeper in 1607. Now let's pivot back to Shakespeare's plays to see where early modern English food and cooking show up in his plays. For instance, in Macbeth, Lady Macbeth makes something called a posset, a drink made of hot spiced milk made into a drinkable curd with wine or ale which she drugs and gives to the guards as she and Macbeth plot to kill Duncan. Wendy Wall wondered if an elite member of Scotland would even know how to make a drug like that. Turns out, during Shakespeare's time, women did have chemistry sets in their kitchens, so Lady Macbeth could make this dangerous drink. Peter Breers also mentions that the drink itself would be incredibly relaxing. If served as a dessert, it could turn a, quote, lively dinner party into a group of dozing drones, unquote even without additional soporific drugs. In Henry IV, Part 1, Prince Hal at one point tries to quiet Falstaff by saying, quote, Peace, chew it, peace, unquote. 
To our modern ear, chew it may sound like a nonsense Shakespearean insult. However, the word chew it is actually, according to John Tufts, an anglicization of the French pastry dough pâte à choux, or for those familiar with the Great British Bake Off, choux pastry, the dough eclairs are made out of. Chewets, as a dish, were individual-sized small pies that had a hand-pinched rim and were filled with either minced meat or fish. So, Hal was calling his friend a doughy meat pie. And of course, in Titus Andronicus, two characters are baked into a meat pie as a result of an ongoing series of revenge plots. This pie would be similar to your standard handheld meat pie sold in inns or those English takeaway shops Bridget Webster mentioned. But we don't have time to talk more about cannibalism in this mini-episode. If you are interested in learning more about food and cooking in Shakespeare's time, we have some recommendations. First, hop over to John Tuff's YouTube channel to watch his cooking videos, and then buy his book, Fat Rascals, Dining at Shakespeare's Table, which resurrects over a hundred recipes straight from the plays of William Shakespeare. If you want to see what a cookbook from Shakespeare's time looked like, look up or buy Eleanor Fetaplace's receipt book, published by Hilary Sperling, which contains recipes and a manuscript inscribed by Eleanor Fetaplace from 1604 through her lifetime. It's a direct view at cooking in an early modern aristocratic house. Last but not least, if you'd like an in-depth exploration of food, dining, and hospitality in Tudor and Early Stuart England, get a copy of Cooking and Dining in Tudor and Early Stuart England by food historian Peter Breers. And that's Food and Cooking in Early Modern England. Thank you for listening to this episode. I'm Courtney Smith. And I'm Elise Sharp. This is Shakespeare Anyone. Thank you so much for listening to Shakespeare Anyone. Works referenced in this episode are available in the episode description. Our theme music is Never Ending Minute by Sounds Like Sander. If you would like to support us, it would help us out if you would hit the subscribe button, like us, leave a comment, write a review, share us on social media, tell a friend about us, all the things. We'd appreciate it. You can also support the podcast at patreon.com slash Shakespeare Anyone. Patreon patrons get access to exclusive bonus content throughout the year. The link is also in the episode description. For more, you can visit our website, shakespeareanyone.com, follow us on Instagram at shakespeareanyonepod, or Twitter at shakespeareanyone. For Twitter, that's Shakespeare any and the number one. Every other platform is spelled out like the name of the podcast. Now, because you listened all the way to the end of the credits, here's a completely random Shakespeare quote for you. From King Henry VI, Part 3, Act 5, Scene 4, spoken by Queen Margaret. Our slaughtered friends, the tackles, what of these?